that talks about uh, that 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 asks where are the women on the boards and uh for me uh being part of such an initiative like girls for girls uh talks about a very interesting story and narrative that we're trying to create early exposure to corporate governance within the women because uh almost 75 percent of smes and uh, homegrown businesses are run by managed by women so if we do early corporate governance exposure for women, I think it's the best way to go. And as an institute, of, as somebody from the Institute of Corporate Governance, I think we're very glad and grateful to be part of uh, Girls for Girls and also to be a very ardent partner for leading both Africa. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Joshua. Thank you very much. and. Uh, Leading Boards is also very excited to be allied with uh, the Institute of Corporate Governance Uganda. Before I introduce our eminent, amazing speaker, let me take this opportunity to introduce one other, uh, one other consultant on the Leading Boards team. Uh, Monica, please wave to, to our participants. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Monica. Professor Monica Chibita, you'll get to know about her a lot more when we discuss, when the panel discussion comes up, but she's part of the team at Leading Boards Africa. I see, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Diana Ninsima is on, this, uh, is on this webinar, but Diana is a board member at Leading Boards Africa. So thank you so much. And uh, just allow me a second to introduce our eminent uh, keynote. Um, ladies, if I had one hour to talk about Hajat, it wouldn't be enough. Her CV is long and it is so heavy because she's done governance in and out. Hajat uh, is a champion of, uh, of uh, green. Let me just put it that way. She, she embodies green here in Uganda and she's been given other names, Mama Insurance and Hajat Green. You can see that tree in her background. She's really an ardent environment uh, fan. Professionally, Hajat is a director at Energizing Solutions Limited. That is a firm that she founded and is a director there. Hajat is also a, a career board member. Now, Hajat has so many accolades. Again, if I started going through them, I would not finish them, but I'll just go through just a few of them. Hajat in 2019 and 2020 was the Africa Insurance Personality of the Year. She was a winner of Africa Insurance Organization Hall of Fame 2019. Hajat is a chartered insurance uh, personnel. She is also an ambassador for the CII Good for All Women in Insurance in Africa. Uh, Hajat is a British Council Climate Change Ambassador, was a British Council Climate Change Ambassador. 2010-2011. She's also been a judge at the Africa uh, Reinsurance Awards 2020. Hajat is the founding president, Women in Insurance, WIN 2019. Like she has said, she's a career board member. This is something that uh, is at her fingertips. She belongs to so many professional memberships, and I will not even go through all of them, but you can see them on screen. That is Hajat for you. And she sits on various boards. Sorry, our, our figures got mixed up a little, but I'll just give you quickly. 2019 to date, Hajat sits on the uh, Uganda Railways Co Corporation board where she's uh, the chairperson of audit and risk. Uh, this is a mandate that expires in 2022. Again, 2019 to date, Hajat sits on the board of the Uganda National Meteorological Authority where she's the chairperson of the technical committee. She's also a member committee of uh, environmental protection, uh, environmental practitioners in Uganda under NEMA. And she's also a, a council member for Kampala University since 2003 to date. 
Now here we're just talking about the board memberships Hajat has from 2019 to date. There are many that have gone before that. And uh, again, if I had to fill it here, it would not be enough. So ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome our keynote speaker, Hajat A.K. Seviala. Over to you, Mama Green. Hajat, you on mute? Yeah, uh, so let's fasten our belts on this flight of 20 minutes. I'm very happy to be here and they allow me to share my presentation. Um, uh, okay. That is the presentation, Building Boardroom Capital, Board Readiness Insights for High Achieving Women. That's what, that's what we are talking about today. And I say to you all, you are most welcome to this presentation. What are we going to cover as we build Boardroom Capital? Number one, we are going to look at the benefits of being a board member. Why should you sit on a board after all? Number two, we are going to look at challenges of being a board member. What is it that you, look, you have to look out for as you sit on a board or as you aspire to? Number three, we are going to look at gender specific challenges. The women on boards, what are those challenges that face you as women? Then number four, how to be an effective board member, an effective woman director, how we are going to have some tips. And then lastly, we shall have to look at entry. How do you enter? How do you become a board member? What is the pathway that takes you to being a board member? And when you are there, what is expected of you? Benefits of being a board member. Why should you become a board member in the first place? And these are given in the order of priority that I have given them. Number one, you develop strategic thinking. You become a strategic thinker so different from ordinary once you become a board member. And then you are able to give strategic direction to institutions. Benefit number two, you are the person who crops a pathway for an institution to fly. You are, the, you are like the pilot. You give the command to this aircraft and then you put it in autopiloting. So you must be able to give the right commands. Then benefit number three is being part of a success story of a company and of a nation. Number four is you have a helicopter view of an institution and by time, helicopter view of the sector. You should be able to be above all and have a feel of what goes on within the institution. That's a big benefit. And number five, the key networks. People who sit on boards are great minds from different backgrounds. So you, you join top-notch network. You know that saying of your network determines your network. This comes true when you join a board and that's a big benefit. Benefit number six, acquiring mouth skills, finance skills, human resource, administration, speaking skills. 
presentation skills, and all aspects of the organization, you've got to have a skill that touches almost all aspects of the organization as a board member. And we all know that knowledge is wealth. And that's your capital. We are talking about boardroom capital this afternoon. Point number seven, some people may put it as point number one, but to me it comes as point number seven. And it may, should not be the main driver, the reward. As a board member, you get, you get some financial rewards. It may not be a lot of money. It's not in tens of millions, as people may suspect or think. It is some money that you get. You also get to travel, uh, that exposure of traveling and benchmarking with other boards, subscriptions, and many others that you get in form of a reward as a board member. Lastly, in the benefits uh, category, the respect, the social capital. You are highly regarded as directors. It is so important, your social capital. We all know that who you know determines who you are. And that comes to light when you become a board member. Having seen the positive, the benefits, there are also challenges that you should look out for when you are a board member. And these challenges, I give you the general ones, then eventually are going to give you the ones that are specific to ladies. Challenge number one is being accountable, yet you are not managerial in church. As a board member, it all starts and stops with you. Anything that goes wrong in the institution, you are fully accountable. Yet you are not in the day-to-day -day charge of the institution. And it is actually impossible for you to know what goes on there from your helicopter world. Number two of the challenges, being on board with people who may have no capacity to handle the assignment. Here, you do not have a say in the way board members are selected. So who you they select to sit with you on the board is who you sit with. Some may not have the necessary capacity. So it becomes a challenge. Challenge number three, boards are about eyes on, hands off. Otherwise, you micromanage. Now the problem, the challenge in eyes on, even if you wanted to touch, you can't touch. You cannot be sure hundred percent that the information management gives you in the board papers is all about the institution. That there's nothing that is hidden. That what they don't want you to see, they don't bring on the table. So that is the challenge of eyes on, hands off. Number four in the challenges is collective responsibility. No matter what your feeling was about a resolution or uh, a, a decision of the board, once a resolution is passed, you are, collect you are collectively responsible. So that's another challenge. Then five, drawing the line between governance and management. You, it is difficult, especially to new board members, once you don't have the expertise, to know where governance stops and where management starts. And yet it is key that you know where you as a board member, where your mandate stops and where the mandate of management starts. The other challenge number six is learning on the job. When you get an appointment letter, most of the time as a board member, they don't tell you uh, this is what you're going to do. They are not terms of reference. So you've got to find your way as a board member. And also learning on the job because there are few schools that will teach you the A, B, C, D, F, Gs of sitting on a board. Number seven of the challenges are cliques. Some of these cliques are called chicken cabinets where you find their cliques within the board, 
They sit outside the boards and decisions are made outside the boards and you become a rubber stamp. You've got to be alert to this. Number eight of the challenges is an assignment. It's not a job. So people may want to take uh, being a board member as a job, it isn't. It's just an assignment. You are not in the day to day. Number nine of the challenges, the CEOs are far higher than the bosses. You as the, the director of the board or, you know, you are the boss of the CEO. But you find that in some institutions, the CEO earns something like 30 million, 40 million or something like that. But the chairman of the board goes away with a monthly, I think, 3 million. The one who is highly paid is about 3 million uh, as a, a, a retainer. So it is the, the CEO earns about 10 times more than the boss. And you can see the challenge there. Some CEOs become bigger than their, their bosses because of that. So you've got to be alert to that and know how to handle that. Uh, lastly, in the challenge section, their personal interests versus organizational interests. It should be like organizational interests are put before your personal interests. But at times, some board members do put personal interests versus organization. That's when you get conflict of interest challenges as a board member. And as a board, you must know how to handle and detect conflict of interest and prevent them from disrupting your work. What are the gender specific challenges? Like ladies who sit on the board, what are those key that challenges that you face as a lady? Number one is actually self-made. Number one, as women, you sit back playing the gender card thinking that since I'm a lady, everything is going to find me here. You need to be aggressive. You need to offer yourself for the hardest. And uh, that, is, uh, that challenge, you should be able to overcome it by uh, facing those challenges head on. Challenge number two, are the, they are male dominated cliques. And this is historical. All boards, except very few, are mainly male-dominated. They have their cliques, they have their boys' clubs, and they discuss their things when you are not there. So that clique, you must be able to be alert to that challenge. Then the chairpersons are mainly male. The people who appoint boards, when they are looking for chairpersons, it is very, very rare that they will look for you as a lady to be a chairperson. So we've got to be alert to that and find a way of being chairpersons to boards. Number four, not preparing. Many times we do not prepare as ladies and we are not assertive. Number five is serving tea, clearing the table, taking minutes among others. You're a board member, but when you enter, you try, you know, the one, please serve me tea. Madam, please serve me tea. You are a board member. You are not the tea girl of the others. You are an equal board member, just like the male counterparts. And you should make sure that you don't sit near the serving table or the entrance. Just go and sit near the chairperson. Then nobody's going to say, come serve me tea. No, no, no. Then number six in the gender specific challenges, uh, women are thought of as lesser board members. Yet they are not. They get the same appointment, they earn the same sitting allowance. They're no less board member, lesser board members, but they are thought of because of the way we present ourselves and because of the way society has labeled us. Number seven in these challenges, ladies, please pay attention to this one. Ladies prepare themselves well for the meeting, but they do not prepare for the meeting. What do I mean? Ladies go to the saloon, make their hair very nice, put on their makeup, put on the best dress to go to a board meeting. And they have not read the papers. They are not carrying any value to the boardroom. So that means they prepare themselves well to look as a flower in the boardroom. 
and that shouldn't be. You should first prepare for the meeting, read the papers, have your views, and then you prepare yourself to look at the flower if you, you have to, to be. The last one, of course, is the usual one, the work-life balance, where you ha we have to juggle so many um, uh, duties, but that is okay, we have learned. Um, tips on becoming an effective board member. How do you become an effective board member? Tip number one that I'll give you, please pay attention to detail. Please pay attention to detail and I repeat it last time, please pay attention to detail. Read board papers, discuss from an informed viewpoint. Point number two, tip number two, be of character, stand out from the crowd. And number three, you are a full board member for goodness's sake. Be confident and hold yourself as such. And number four, continuous improvement in all aspects, your mental, your networks, make sure that you do continuous improvement all the time and you measure and check the improvements that you're making. Number five of the tips, take challenges on uh, head on in their hide opportunities. What do I mean here? As ladies, offer yourself for every minute chairing a, a committee, the hardest committee. Don't only look for the human resource committee. Chair the, the HUD, the finance committee. Chair the technical committee. Chair the audit and risk. Chair those very difficult committees. Present yourself. If you find you have challenges, consult. Consult, then you should be able to become an effective member. I will... Uh, as I come to the end, I'll let you know how to enter the board. But now we look at once you have entered, what is expected of you as a board member? Number one of the expectations, you have to understand the institution in totality or globally and be able to contribute towards giving it the required strategic direction. Number two of the expectation to read the board papers well and form your opinion before the board meeting. Number three, to attend and contribute in all board, committee, board and committee meetings and well prepared. Then to ask the right questions. You should not be uh, the, the, the group think that uh, what so and so says is what I go by. You've got to give your view. Uh, what is expected of you again to be a team player, because board work is about teamwork. So you've got to be a team player. Then the last one or the other one, you have to respect others' contributions. Even if you know so much, you need to, you need to respect others' contributions and think through them, but you should not rubbish whatever. You need to respect others because you are equal board members. You have the same appointing authority, you have the same remuneration, you have the same uh, um, terms. Now, the other expectation to be focused on the issues and bring solutions to the organization's challenges. Then the last one, the second last, to uplift the image of the institution by presenting yourself well. You should not present yourself in such a manner that brings disrepute to the organization. And then the last one here is to be a role model. Are you somebody they look up to? Are you somebody who walks in and everybody says, yes, the director has come in. I'd like to be like her. I'd like to be like Mama Hajat, you know? Are you that role model? Now, the tips about sitting versus earning, you know, when we sit in boardrooms, we are sitting. But then at the end of that sitting, after we've done some work, we do the earning. Now, make sure you earn for sitting, but not sit for earning. In here, you've got to weigh the value that you bring on the table. What value is what they are paying you? 
um, the value are you, are you paid for the value you're bringing on the table? Or you just sign the book, walk away and wait for your check. For your check. So you need to make sure that you earn for sitting, but not sit for earning. Not just asking to sign the book and run away, no. So never take people you meet as just numbers. Make sure that the people you meet, you take their details, you talk to them, you build a network. You never know who would give you the reference that you so badly need. The other point I want to leave you with here, even working from home, most of the time we work from home. These days with the pandemic for two years, and you find some people when they are working from home, like I'm speaking to you now from my home, uh, people are you know, not properly dressed. They are like putting on kalesu. When they say put on your video, people are running away. So when you are working from, even if you are working from home, wake up the usual time, dress up smartly and sit on your home office table. And then you will be in that mindset to do the work that you're supposed to do, even when you are not at the, the usual office. Uh, create a legacy. What is your legacy? What is your mukululo? What is it that they have to remember you on this board? What is it when you look back? Are there people you have mentored? Is there something you have guided on that you think, yes, yeah, this is my legacy? Are you that person? You need to create a legacy. Then the campus, ladies. Ladies, this campus is about your integrity. Your campus must point true north. Your values must be so, so clear. Nobody should play with you in one way or another. You know what I mean. Your integrity, your values, and everything must be so, so clear for you to be a very effective uh, and impactful board member. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I come to the end, I'd like to give you entry points. How do you then enter the boat? I have given you all the advantages, the benefits, the challenges, what is expected of you, how to be an effective one. But then after knowing all that, how do you enter? Uh, how do you join a boat? My advice is that you have to be intentional, completely intentional. You must be visible. You must stand out from the crowd. You must be visible. I, I even tell my people, the ones I speak to, that never leave a room unnoticed. Either the way you dress or the way you speak. So make sure that you are visible. Then number two, the networks. Make sure that you build the right networks, people who would make the references. And then number three, volunteer. Volunteer to sit on a board even if you are not paid. That will give you the expertise, it will give you the experience, it will build your, your CV. And uh, why, why do I tell you this being intentional? Because other than today I'm seeing some boards are advertising. But 90% of the boards are not advertised. It is through headhunting. It is through references. And they will not headhunt you if you don't belong to a network. You've got to belong to a right network so that they are able to look for you. And then they give you the opportunity. And once you get the opportunity, make sure that you build your capacity, that capital, that your skills are top notch. And then the experience, be that board member that always scores like 99% or even 100% in board evaluations. So that if there's an opportunity for another board, you are number one when they are looking for people who perform. These ministries have a data bank. How did you fare? And they, they receive these evaluations. So depending on how you fare, then you keep being on there, you know, being recycled, as I know that everybody, they'll be looking for you. It will be for you to say, no, 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 here I'm not coming. You have so many opportunities. It will be now for you to say no. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our keynote. I thank you so much. 
and I request you to go green and protect our environment. I want you to plant a tree today or tomorrow to remind you of the day when we had this talk. You can call it leading boss, you can call your tree Mama Green, Mama Hajat, but please plant a tree so that we protect the environment. Also be a high achiever. I'll be very happy to see that you go to implement whatever I have talked to you today. I thank you so much for listening to me. And uh, now I take you back to the moderator. May God bless all of you uh, who are on this call. Thank you and thank you so much. Don't forget to go green. This is Hajat Sebiala, Mama Green, saying thank you and may God bless all of you. Wow. <clears throat> Wow, 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 Hajat, <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much, Hajat. That was a very insightful presentation. I'm sure that the ladies have learned so much from you. Um, just an aside, a note on the side, my chair, I have seen you on this, uh, on this webinar. Hajat has told us to stop being chairs of human resource and governance. I am uh, putting in my resignation and going for finance. So uh, my board chair, I know that you're there. Please note. <laughs> so Please ladies, wait for the rotation to be done. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Susan, for that. Uh, thank you, Hajat. That was an amazing presentation. You've delivered amazingly critical insights for the ladies. The benefits of being on a board cannot be uh, overemphasized. Ladies, we are waiting for you in the boardroom. We are waiting for you in, at the decision-making table. Let us stand up and aim for chairpersonship. We are not aiming for others. The, we want to be like Susan and Monica and all the chairs on this, uh, uh, on this webinar. So um, ladies, again, without going into, uh, without wasting much time, uh, please, if you have a question, kindly type it in the Q&A. Someone is going to be there to receive it and to respond to it at the appropriate time. Hajat, thank you so much. I'm going to plant a tree today in honor of this day because the insights you've given will stay with us for a long time. Thank you so much, Hajat. Um, ladies, we're now moving into our panel session. I'm going to invite my colleague, Mrs. S. Winnie Sewava, to introduce the panelists, but before she comes in, I have to introduce Winnie to you. Um, those in Girls for Girls, you've already met Winnie. Winnie is a mentor in Girls for Girls, but I am also proudly associated because she's a chartered governance professional. She's an associate of the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators, UK and Ireland, and uh, she's done a lot of corporate secretarial uh, work. She's done a lot of consulting in governance previously with Deloitte and uh, right now with uh, EADB, Winnie, if I'm not mistaken. Um, she's still doing amazing things in the governance space. Winnie, so welcome and please uh, take it on. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Francesca. Good evening, ladies. Um, thank you so much, Hajati. That was a wonderful presentation. I was taking notes and my book is really full. I've seen already some questions in the chat room for you and we will get an opportunity to address those questions, ladies. Let us listen from a, a very, very wonderful panel of ladies who are on the call. I would like to introduce them briefly. Their bios are quite detailed, they are well learned, but I'll introduce them briefly and give them an opportunity to tell us more about themselves as they speak and share with us on how we can build our boardroom capital. I'll start with uh, Susan. Um, Susan founded Quality Assurance and Management Consultants, a firm offering training and consulting services in quality management, food safety, environmental management, health and safety, and asset management. She has over 20 years experience as a consultant working with medium to large enterprises, government institutions, and non-governmental bodies. She's registered with NEMA. Uh, she, she holds a practitioner's license to carry out environmental impact assessments and environmental audits. She's the chairperson of the Management Systems and Standards Technical Committee, 
and is charged with recommending to the National Standards Council the standards to be adopted by the country. She's currently serving on the World Vision Board as chairperson and is the board vice chairperson for New Vision Printing and Publications Company Limited, a company listed on the Uganda Securities Exchange. Susan, please wave to the ladies. All Good right, afternoon, ladies. Fun. Thank you for joining us. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Leading Boards, for having me. Girls for Girls, congratulations on the work that you're doing. You're very welcome, Susan. Our next panelist is a Professor Monica Chivita. She's Professor and Dean, Faculty of Journalism, Media and Communications, and has been the coordinator of the No Head Capacity Building Project at UCU since 2013. She holds a Doctor of Literature and Philosophy in Communication from the University of South Africa, an MA in Journalism from the University of Iowa, and a BA in Education from Makere University. Susan has, um, Professor, sorry, has served on very, very many boards. I hope I can get all this in. Um, she has served as uh, UBC, on the board of UBC, the New Vision Chair for two years, African Center for Media Excellence, East Africa Communication Association, where she was president for four years, Amrit Health Africa Uganda, World Vision Uganda, where she was chair for three years, World Vision International, vice chair for two years. She has published on the subjects of indigenous language media, media history, media regulation, media education, and new media and participation. She's an associate editor of the Journal of African Media Studies and serves on the auditorial bodies for several other journals in the field, including Nodicom Review, Communication, African Journalism, and so many others. Professor Monica, you're very, very welcome. Please say hello to the ladies. Monica, you're muted. I'm sorry, that is the perennial sin. Uh, thank you very much, Winnie. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a great honor to be with you this afternoon. We are delighted to have you, Professor. Uh, lastly, but not least, is uh, Stella Alibatesa, who is currently with the Personal Data Protection Office as the National Personal Data Protection Director in the Personal Data Protection Office. Um, She's responsible for the management and operationalization of the Personal Data Protection Office and the National Focal Point for Monitoring and Assurance of Matters related to the implementation of the Data Protection and Privacy Act of 2019. She's a practicing advocate with 20. five years experience with the bulk of it being in policy and regulatory matters in public sector. Um, Stella also has of London, UK, a postgraduate diploma in project planning from UMI, a postgraduate diploma in legal practice from the LDC Kampala, and a bachelor's of law from Akere University. Uh, Susan, kindly wave to the ladies as well. Good afternoon, ladies. I'm happy to be here. Beautiful You're conversation welcome. going on. Thank you. You're very welcome, Stella. And her judge is going to be coming back on the panel. So ladies, all of you had questions for her or who wanted to get something more from her, she's going to be back on. So Hajat, if you're able to put on your video, you can come back and we'll be delighted to engage with you and to keep learning from you. I would like to start with a, with a question for, for Susan. Because uh, coming from Hajat's presentation, most of the ladies, if you go to the chat room, they are geared up, they're excited. But I'm wondering, where do I start from if I want to sit on a board of directors? I'm here as we need, they've introduced me, I've come to this webinar, I'm now geared up. Come Monday, where do I start, Susan? Thank you very much um, for that question. Good afternoon, ladies. Thank you for sparing the time to improve yourselves. Now, uh, in answering the question, I want you to think about all the introductions you have just had, starting from uh, the keynote address, Hajat Seriala, and all the panelists who have been introduced. You will find that the common theme is that all the ladies are experts in something. Now, Hajat talked about visibility and standing out. 
How do you stand out? The first step is to stand out in your field, whatever field it is. Let it be finance, let it be insurance, let it be journalism. You need to first stand out in that field because when they are looking for board members, and I've had a chance to sit on both the nomination and governance committees on the boards where I have served. The first thing we look at is what skills are we looking for? And then the names of the people who are the best in that field are brought to the table. So if you do not stand out in your field, then chances are it's very difficult for your name to get to the table. So you need to as much as possible invest in getting to, to know what you do and to know the ins and outs of that profession. So that is the starting point. Because if you, if you stand out both in the knowledge and the experience you have, then there's a natural progression because you are then nominated to come to the board. But in order for you not to just sit like a flower, you need to be able to contribute. And how do you contribute? It now comes from the knowledge and experience that you have gained in your field over a certain period of time. So as much as possible, do your time. There, um, we have this saying where people always want to get ahead of the queue. The challenge of getting ahead of the queue is that you do not gain the knowledge and the experience that you require to sit at that table. So what gives you the knowledge and the experience is doing your time. Learning, if it is banking, do your time. Move up the ladder. As you move up the ladder, with each step, there's a new lesson you learn. And that step prepares you for the next level. So the first thing I would emphasize, be good at what you do. And being good at what you do, you need to invest time and effort in learning and gaining the right kind of experience. And that is the knowledge and experience that now helps you when you sit at table. Don't try to jump the queue because you miss out key lessons that you need. And it usually comes out when you're not able to contribute to a conversation Sometimes it's because you don't know what to say or you don't know whether what you are going to say is the right thing to say. And why do you have that level um, of uncertainty, a situation where you're not clear in your mind of what you're going to talk about? It is because you don't have the experience. So that is the value doing your time. So, Bini, back to you. Thank you, Susan. I, I love that. And I think I'll go to Stella with this particular question, drawing from what you've said. So here I am, I'm a hardworking employee. I know my numbers, I'm leading, you know, doing very, very well. But I would like to ask Stella, what then is the difference between, you know, management and governance on that perspective? How do I transition? Because Susan has told us to be, take the time, gain the skill, I've gained the skill. You know, I know my mm -hmm. figures, I know what the organization is about, I know the industry but what do I need to actually understand between being a good manager and then transitioning into a governance or being on a board? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, many of us struggle uh, when we go to, uh, to, the board, uh, to the board level because uh, when you get there, your role is actually different as already highlighted by Hajat Seviala. Remember that you're now at policy level as opposed to the operational level where you are as uh, let's say uh, a director or a manager. That means the things you look at are different. These issues are broad because you have to know why were you appointed on that board. So you must make sure that you deliver that value that was expected of you. When you're a board member, you look at the broader aspects of the organization. And these can be internal issues or external issues. It means when you sit on a board, 
rather than be in your own um, cocoon, let's say as the chief accountant. Now you, look at, you have to look at numbers in a different way. How do these numbers contribute to the growth of the organization? What risks are there uh, that may affect this organization? What priorities must we fund uh, to be able to deliver the value that this uh, organization or this company wants? If this is a private company, shareholders want profit, they want growth within the organization. If it is a government body, they want visibility, they want uh, compliance, uh, they want to deliver the mandate of that organization. So you have to be mindful of that. And you have different things you do at the management level and at the board level. One of the challenges that you see when you transition to the board, uh, Hajat Seviala talked about it, micromanaging. Are you going to be looking at every detail? Are you going to bypass the CEO and talk to each and every director? That is not your role. Your role as a board member is to guide. It is to receive information. You utilize the information you would have gotten from the industry within the organization and outside of the industry and guide the management team. You have to be able to give the management enough time uh, to be able to respond to some of the issues that you would have raised or some of the requirements that you'd have given them. So because the board is at policy level, because the board uh, does not get involved in the operational aspects, that's why Hajat Seviala also said that you take responsibility, yet you're not actually in the kitchen. So if someone is cooking that food, uh, the management will be the ones to get all the ingredients. Let me give a, 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 this example. But when that food is served, the taste, um, the views of those people who have eaten that food will be your responsibility as a board. So it is important that when we transition to that level, we know the difference. You are at policy level, so you have to keep at that policy level. For you to be able to do a good job at that policy level, implement those measures Hajat has talked about. Are you reading the board papers? Are you preparing adequately for those board, paper, uh, for those board decisions or board discussions? Are you doing your research? Are you reading about the industry? Indeed, it is true that anyone can actually become a board member because we are experts in different fields and different companies do different things. But you must be knowledgeable. They will not appoint you as a board member if you're not knowledgeable. If you're lucky and you get to that point, but you misbehave at that level, you'll also have uh, challenges. I've had cases where uh, people I know have been elevated to the board. And then you see um, management coming to you behind the scenes and saying, Stella, can you please help us? This person wants to get into these details. They are shouting at us. Um, they, they challenge some of the proposals that we've given. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes we are not given enough time to explain ourselves. So we need to be mindful of that. Because when you have that opportunity to sit at that table, if you do not perform, then these people who are around you will talk about you and you will not get other opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stella. And coming from someone who's actually made the transition, that makes a lot of sense. I would like to go to uh, Professor Monica. And, you know, when we started this call and with a presentation we got and all the excitement that Francesca gave us with a board readiness program, I'm starting to think that being a board member is not as easy as we thought. What, what can you tell us from your experience? You've been a board member for so many, you know, Ugandan global international organization. What are those pitfalls that we need to actually look out as we start our journey? What advice can you give us? Um, you've seen our attendance. We have young people. We have aspiring people. We have already board members. What should we look out for? What mistakes shouldn't we be making at this point? Mm. Um, particularly as a new new board member, I think one of the things that uh, you want to avoid, very basic things, one of the things you want to avoid is 
missing meetings. You don't join a board and then start giving excuses, meeting one, I'm busy, meeting two, I'm busy. There are some boards where if you miss two meetings in a row or three, you are out, regardless of how good you are. So those are very, very basic things. Um, then joining cliques, Hajat alluded to cliques and kitchen cabinets. It's very easy as a board member to be co-opted into a clique. But if you're new, you don't really know what is going on and you may end up in a group that is actually counterproductive. Cliques are not encouraged on boards anyway. So steer clear of cliques. The other thing of course is blabbing about board, board matters. You sit in a board meeting and then as soon as the board ends, you say, hey, by the way, did you know this is happening with that company? They are going under and so on. The other thing is jumping the board secretary because when you are new on the board, you need to understand that the board secretary is your go-to person if you need to get any information from management and so on. If you start bypassing them and speaking directly to the head of HR because you're on the HR committee and so on, there is a challenge with that. Um, then I, I really am glad that Tajet brought out the issue of uh, of making tea and so on. That is not a joke, by the way, in our Uganda here. If you're not careful, you may end up being um, a tea girl. So you need to be very careful to make it clear that it's very nice to make tea, but please, you're welcome. The table is here. Do mix your own cup of tea. It's a different thing if you out of courtesy serve somebody a cup of tea. But if people begin to expect that they will sit down and you are the one who will serve it because you are female, that's another matter. And then the other thing is uh, remaining silent for too long. I think as a new board member, you want to listen, maybe for one meeting or two at most, but eventually you need to begin speaking and you, you need to begin speaking from an informed point of view, which takes us back to the issue of, of preparedness. And, uh, and also avoid being sucked into groupthink, because sometimes when you sit on a board, you realize that the board has gotten into this culture where people kind of gravitate towards the easiest solution. They don't want to do the hard thinking. And I think you need to kind of make it clear that you are not going to be sucked into that and that you're going to be an independent thinker. I'm sure we'll have some more time to speak about these things. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for, for that. And it really makes a lot of sense. And someone had actually asked in the chat room that do people really ask you to sub tea in the boardroom yes. and yet you're there as an eco board member? Mm. Yes, it happens. Yeah, um, I'm glad we're hearing this from experienced women who are here with us. So ladies, this is a good place to be. And we are getting to see why it's really important to be part of a board readiness program. And that is what a leading board Africa will be telling us more about. Hajat, the questions are so many for you, but I think the burning question for people is how do you do it? How do you manage to be a career board member? Please tell the ladies, what do you do? How do you balance that? You are a career board member, you own all these boards, you're managing a consultancy. What does that look like for you? Thank you very much. Uh, the issue is you must be organized. You must plan your time. You must plan your work and you must plan yourself. You must plan. You, you, you must plan. I think planning is the key thing. You must plan your time. You must have a diary. You must know when to do what. Otherwise, if you don't, you get so disorganized. Uh, then you, you find you are supposed to be speaking here. Then you commit it that time. So you've got to be organized. You've got to be able to plan and you must be intentional and deliberate in whatever you do. Uh, basically, those are the things. The rest I have talked about in my presentation. I don't know, Madam, if you'd uh, um, allow me to recognize a lady from Nigeria on this call. She's called Tonya Smart. She's our first lady in the insurance industry in Africa. She's married to the president of the insurance, in Afri the insurance organization in Africa. She's on this call and uh, very supportive of women causes. 
and they, she encourages others to do what is called um, sister, it's sort of like sister keepers, sister keepers, to be able to pull up others. So basically, that is the answer to your question. It's a short one, but it has a lot in there. I thank you. Thank you very much, Hajat. I love that. Planning is the key. Being able to plan your time, being organized, and it's as simple as that, or perhaps as complicated as that. We are learning that this is not as easy as it looks. I would like to invite Susan back and ask you something that could be at the heart for many of the, not just the younger people, but even people who've left employment and they're running their own businesses. People could be wondering, as an entrepreneur, what does all this board readiness thing have to do with me? Can I serve on a board or do they only want people who are in corporates, bankers, insurers? What, where do I fit in as an entrepreneur? Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, for that question. Um, I just want to assure the ladies that even if your path um, is on the uh, entrepreneurship side, you started on the entrepreneurship side, it doesn't mean that the opportunities for you to become a board member are closed out, no, because there is key experience that you can get in, in that journey that is useful on the board. I'll give you an example. When banks are looking to grow their businesses with SMEs, then chances are they would look for entrepreneurs in that space because you have a good understanding of how an SME operates because you have been an SME, but also the networks you have are within that space. So remember, you come to the board because of your unique knowledge and experience in a particular sector. And that is what they are looking to tap into. And you can have a situation where um, an organization is looking to understand the private sector better or to even attract um, opportunities within the private sector. So your knowledge of, your private sec of the private sector is what is going to qualify you to sit on the board. So in any way, don't think to yourself that because um, I have started out as an entrepreneur, I don't have the key experience that will qualify me to be a board member. No, you do have that experience. But sometimes when you're building that experience, you don't even know that it is going to be valuable at a certain time T. I would like to share my own personal journey because I've never uh, worked, say, in, a, in the public sector. I started out in the private sector and soon after that started my consulting firm. And I, I spent a lot of time building the skills in consulting, in training. That was really where I built my core competencies. But when... Um, I was invited to sit on his boards. It was because they were looking for people with key experience in the private sector. Now, as I was doing my time, I did not realize that those skills that I was getting were the ones that were going to qualify me to sit these positions. In fact, at the time when I was invited, I was thinking to myself, did they get it wrong? Am I in the right place? But yes, they had gotten it right. That is what they were looking for. So your experience as an entrepreneur is still useful because of the networks, because of the insights you can give about how the private sector operates, because of all the nitty gritty that goes on that you are aware of, but sometimes you don't even um, appreciate that it is valuable experience that somebody would be looking for at any one time. Over to you, Mini. Thank you, thank you very much, Susan. I think that is very practical for, for each one of us and especially um, ties in with what you told us as well at the beginning to just make sure you build yourself up and not to skip any of those steps because then you become credible in the industry that you're in, whether it is your small business, whether it is you know takeaway or fashion and then people can look for you in that very industry that you're in. 
Um, Stella, there's a question I'm seeing in the chat room, and people seem to keep asking again about that difference between management and governance. Perhaps you could share with us your own personal transition from management to boards. And if I'm a manager, how do I become a board member? Those could be different issues, but what was the personal journey for you like? Uh, thank you very much for that question, Winnie. Uh, for me, um, I did my first, my first board was uh, as a board member of FIDA Uganda. FIDA is the Federation of uh, Women Lawyers. Um, after that, I, I became a board member on another NGO where I'm still a board member. And this is a board member in the health sector. Uh, it's called uh, PES Uganda. I also have board memberships on uh, private organizations, uh, such as one which does uh, uh, processing of grain and other pulses. It's called Amagara Commodities. My journey to those boards and the others I sit on were largely because of the issues that have be already been raised on this uh, webinar. Uh, being there for a certain expertise, in my case, it was my legal field. Um, most of the work that I was able to do, uh, for instance, for um, Amagara Commodities, I was invited by some of the members of the, by some of the shareholders because of my expertise on legal, on legal matters, but also my ability to do uh, other volunteer work that helps with uh, startups, especially. Now, for you to move to that level, obviously you have to prepare yourself. In G4G, we call it the gathering years. Those years of experience, those different um, activities or assignments that you take on, you may see them as inconsequence or inconsequent, but actually they build you up. Um, for instance, I was a corporation secretary for, for NSSF, which is one of our largest uh, organizations. While working there, I was a committee member for a number of things. Um, on their procurement committee, I was there. On their investment committee, I was there. On their uh, project implementation, I was there. And when you're on these committees, you learn many things. Uh, if you're on an organization, in, working in an organization like NSSF, they do different things. So you're able to look into, let's say, uh, a prospectus for a company that's uh, working in hotels. The next thing you look at is a construction company for you know, a multi-level building. The other issue you look at is real estate. But you can be on those committees and still not learn anything because you're not present. It's very important for us to be present, to be in the moment. If you're given an assignment, put in your effort, read about it, learn from the experts. In some of my interactions, I would be dealing with architects, I would be dealing with engineers, I would be dealing with quantity surveyors, I would be dealing with bankers, and I would ask them questions. If you do not know a question, ask and people will be very willing to give you that information. So over those, those years, I was able to pick up a lot of information. And obviously, if people know uh, that you're able to address their concerns, if you're able to speak up in meetings and be able to deliver quality work, someone will pick you to be a board member. And that is what happened in my case. Now, when you get to that position, you have, as I said earlier, to remember why you're there and the difference between management and governance or the board level. The board level is the overarching. If I can say, um, if you have, um, I don't know how to explain it. If you have um, maybe, um, I can say maybe a human being, the board is the head, the one that governs, that decides all our activities that we do are decided by our brain, which is at the top. 
So the board is at that top level. So it will decide policy, it will uh, decide strategy. Uh, the board is there to assist you with certain activities. The board is uh, where the back stops because management will implement the strategy that has been approved by the board. You're there to do the quality checks and balances because when management presents their budget, for instance, they have to present it to the board. And for you at the board, you're evaluating, you're not looking at the detail in the numbers, but you're supposed to look at, will this budget in its overall uh, uh, nature, will it be able to deliver the ideal that this organization wants? Will it be able to deliver the growth that this company wants? Will this staff that we have, this organization structure, for instance, when you are at the board level, unless you're a very small company, I don't expect you to be uh, recruiting the receptionist, recruiting the officers, boards recruit the CEO. And then they expect that that CEO will implement an organization structure that the board will have approved. So if you look at the things the board approves, the strategy, the organization structure, uh, the budget, these are things that are at the, the guiding documents, let's say, for the board. So if you see yourself looking into the recruitment of a receptionist, just know you're doing management's work. If you see yourself uh, wanting to dissect the budget, and looking at the, the detail, what will this directorate get? Your question for that directorate or that department should be that this department is a priority in this organization because we need it to deliver this value for the company. I'm finding that you've not given it enough resources. So your question as the board member will be, why doesn't this department have enough money? You should be getting quarterly reports, for instance, on the financial performance. I wouldn't expect a board member, for instance, to be uh, looking for customers. The board member's role would be, uh, management has tried maybe to reach a very, very critical stakeholder and they failed. The role of the board, because that is where the buck stops, is to come to you and tell you we've done one, two, three measures and we are not able to get these stakeholders on board. And that is when the board will then kick in and, and, and assist using the networks Hajat had already talked about, using the experience that Hajat had talked about. So the board role is more of advisory. It is more of guidance, but the actual doing, the actual implementation, the operational work must be done by management. If you're able to differentiate between those two roles, between the board and the management, you'll be able to do very well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stella, for that clarification. I think I get it very well now and advisory and operational that has really, really come out. I'd like to invite uh, Professor Monica, if you could just help us then understand are there you know, particular tools that we can use as new directors to improve our effectiveness? Because a lot of these things that Stella has pointed out, are we going to be able to do them? What tools can we use to get better and do a better job as directors? Okay, if you will allow me, I'll speak a little bit about what kinds of things a new director needs to be worrying about so that you know what tools to look for. And one of the things that you want to be worrying about as a new director is what is the vision, mission and vision of this organization? Where do they see themselves and what do they exist for? And then what are their core values? I think it's th that, that becomes a major thing for a new member because until you internalize that, you are not going to be a very, a very useful resource. So you need to go on a search for that to understand the size and the reach of the organization the quality portfolio and reach of the organization to study the annual reports. Those are fairly, you know, easy to find and understand where do they stand with their finances and so on. What are their major risks? Because those are going to come back to you. What committees do they have and what do these committees do? Um, 
even when do they meet is important to know as a new board member, what is the board culture, et cetera. Now, in terms of actual board resources, I found a few very useful resources. One of them is um, a website called, okay, let me say broadly, the internet is an incredible resource. But specifically, there is a resource called Board Source. And many of the resources on there are free. I have a link which I'll share with you. And, and it has all kinds of information. You can actually learn a lot about boards just at that place. The other thing, the other resource I found useful is a book by somebody you may know called uh, Mustafa Mugisa. He works for the Institute for Corporate, Go Corporate Governance, Uganda. He's written a book called Tools for an Effective Board Member. And it's an incredibly good resource. That is something that I would recommend. Another resource which we sometimes ignore is senior board members. Senior board members within the same organization, but also senior board members in other organizations. They have a wealth of knowledge and experience and they can help you avoid the pitfalls that we talked about at the beginning. The board secretary is also a very useful resource. You, they, are, they tend to be like encyclopedia. By the time they select them to be board secretary, they know the bylaws, they know the articles of association, what goes and what doesn't go and so on. The last resource that I have found extremely effective is prayer. There are situations on a board where without prayer, you will not make it. And I can testify to this. And I've used this with the corporate listed companies as well as NGOs, whether religiously inclined or not. Uh, prayer can get you out of a very, very messy situation as a board member, as a new board member, as a senior board member, or even as a board chair. So those are some of the resources that I would share. Well, thank you so much, Professor. I would never have thought of, uh, you know, the, the board member or the, the existing director as a resource. My mind always goes to what new book do I need to read? What is out from the Institute that I need to get? What article is there? So I love that relation to use the resources that are there within your reach and then be able to maximize that knowledge. I see Hajat has a hand up, please. Go ahead and share with us. Yes, I, I wanted to thank Professor Monica for that. But I also wanted to add on the resources for this new board member, the things that you should ask for is the strategic plan of this institution. Do they have a strategic plan where you find all these things that uh, Professor Monica has talked about? And the other thing that you have to ask for do they have what is called a board, a board manual or a board charter, where all these things about the, the, the board and the, how it should uh, conduct itself, do they have a board manual or do they have a board charter? So you read the manual or the charter and any other tool that is related to board, the way the board conducts itself. And then, they, um, the other one is, the, of course, the articles, the MOUs, that mm -hmm. say the, the instruments that set up this organization. Mm -hmm. If it is set up by law, like most government agencies, then you've got to know what that law is and read it. What does it say about boards and the responsibilities of boards? Uh, having said that, I would also like, I know you have not asked me, but you did ask the other time. And probably I just need to uh, add on to the answer I gave you that I make sure that I'm mouth skilled, that I know a bit of each and everything. And if I check myself with the skill I lack, I go and get that skill by way of continuous improvement. I make sure that I'm really every skill you are looking for, I have. And then the other thing is that I like sharing knowledge and pulling up others. In so doing, you learn a lot. When you share, uh, then you get back and you learn a lot. Mm -hmm. And then the last one that I want to tell you is that uh, I try to be the best that I can be in every situation. 
on, on every assignment. I try to be the best that I can be in that I'm able to bring out my all, so that if there is any assignment in that line, they will always look for me and it would be for me to say no, and maybe I refer to other people who I know have that capability. I really thank you very much. It is quite interesting, this, uh, this discussion. Thank you, madam. Ah, Hi, Esther Abulo, you, you on this call. Hi, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that testimony, Esther. I'm really happy that you say I did something for you. Thank you. <laughs> Let's continue, sorry. Let's continue, madam, with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you for supplementing, Hajat. I know you're very well connected. We have uh, 75 other attendees on the call, and I would really want to give them a chance to ask their questions. But just before we get to the attendees, I wanted to ask Susan, if you could just let us know, are there any affordable or board readiness programs that are within our reach? Because that is what this whole program has been about. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. There are quite a, a number of programs that, um, First of all, I want to recognize that we have two types of people, the ladies who are aspiring and those who are board members somewhere, uh, probably they started on a smaller board and they would want to progress to a higher level. So in, in selecting the resources available, let me start off by talking to the ladies who are aspiring. You're not yet there, but you see that this is something that you, you, would, want, you would want to work towards. And, and therefore the question of what resources do you require? There are quite a number of uh, <clears throat> programs that you can do online. <clears throat> One of the institutes that I have found quite um, um, informative in terms of resources that they have is the Institute of Governance in, in South Africa. They, they are the ones published um, the King Code. If you can Google it, it's a free resource that talks about um, governance in all its forms and colors. But specifically that institute runs quite a number of programs. And sometimes they even have free webinars that can be attended, but they also have free resources. So that would be a good starting point because they usually have information about governance, especially on the African, on the African continent. So if you want to understand the ins and outs, the issues concerning values, some of the, um, the practices that we have today, how they have evolved, that would be a good starting point. And even building on what Stella said about that, um, that, that delicate balance or that dividing line between governance and and management. So if you are learning, and this is an area of interest for you, I would, um, I would refer you to that very good resource because they have information available. Now for those who are already board members, there, there are certain key issues that Monica and Hajati have highlighted. And this depends on the type of organization on which you're serving on as a board member. We have organizations where governance is in the infancy stage. If governance is in the infancy stage, you will not find the level of organization that Hajati has talked about where probably they have a strategic plan and a board manual and what. Now, this is your opportunity to stand out as somebody who's bringing in value because it now becomes your job to point out that it would be good for us to have these documents in place. We need to have a strategy that is um, approved by the board. We need to have a manual. 
Now, the board manual sets out the boundaries and most of the time prevents um, situations where um, the board is not clear on what process it is going to follow. So you're, if you are in one of those organizations where some of these things are not in place, I think this gives you the opportunity to shine because you can then go back and say to them, you know what, we can organize our work better if we have a board manual that defines exactly the roles and responsibilities of the board. And that way we end up not interfering management and we are able to give them insight, we are able to give oversight rather than micromanage them. So that is a good starting point for you to, um, to shine. Now then there are people who have been appointed to the more organized boards. For example, if you sit on a board of a listed company, an international organization, then you'll find that most of these things are in place. And that is because the governance as, governance as a discipline in those particular organizations uh, in, is, is in the mature, in, in the mature uh, stage. And therefore, the resources that are available to you to where you now need to and get more information to ensure that you don't stick out as uh, somebody who doesn't know what they are talking about. Some of these resources, are, um, the question was affordable, but you're going to find that most of the good governance courses are actually not cheap, whether locally or internationally. And that's why you'll find that even when it came to the Institute of Corporate Governance, IFC had to fund the starting phase. It is because those courses are not cheap. So I know that Institute of Corporate Governance um, uh, does that. I know that leading boards is starting up with some new uh, programs. I don't know whether they are going to be offered um, to the market openly but we can be advised as, as to how that will be done. But uh, the, the company that the Institute of Corporate Governance has been offering a number of these programs. And then of course, um, we, um, there are organizations that do specialized uh, programs. For example, our firm usually focuses on specialized um, programs for boards um, that speak to those specific industries and they are not open. And there's a reason why they are not open. It is because, for example, our work um, involves helping organizations build systems. Part of building those systems leads up to what is happening at the board. So in order to, to ensure that the board understands what is going on on this side, then we come in to develop capacity of the board to be able to give sufficient um, oversight. So I think I have tried as much as possible to speak to the needs of the different uh, ladies that we have on the call. Back to you, Winnie. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, for that. Um, I've had so much, but I've learned that it's not cheap. So we need to be able to plan to save and to actually make an investment if you want yes. to see actual boardroom quality material. I would like to yes. give an opportunity to four ladies to ask questions. If your hand goes up, uh, you will be able to unmute and ask a question. Uh, short of that, we've had so many questions in the, in the chat room. I will see, let me see if I can go through them. Francesca, was anyone... Um, if there's anyone who'd like to take us to the questions, that's okay. But I can read through them and then our panelists can take note and answer. I would like us to use this opportunity to. Thank you. Thank you so uh, much, Francesca. Uh, Winnie, um, just one more thing for the people who are aspiring to become board members. There is the League of East African Directors. I've just remembered it right now. The League of East African Directors. Um, what happens is that you can, you apply to become a member 
Now, the reason why the network is important is because when corporate organizations are looking for board members, sometimes they, they, they refer to the League East Africa directors to use their database to find the board members. But of course, the membership fee is, is not cheap. But if you are interested, it is something that you need to look towards. If you are an HR practitioner, I, I advise that you join the Federation of Uganda Employers because when they are looking for HR people or boards, then that is a resource that most boards use, especially when they are looking for directors that have the HR experience. Uh, sorry, I cut in there, Winifred, back to you. Quite okay, Francesca was going to take us through the questions in the chat room. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Winnie, and I'll go straight to the questions that are coming through in the chat. Uh, Susan mentioned about the board readiness program. We shall be talking about that at the end of this uh, session. So there's a question here for you, Hajat. And I know that uh, Stella uh, had uh, ably answered this question, but you can add something. Someone is saying, can Hajat throw more light on how to draw clear lines between governance and management? Hajat, have you got that? It's specifically uh, addressed to you. Okay, as Hajat prepares to answer that, there's also another question. Um, I don't know who will respond to this, but uh, maybe let me direct this to Prof. Uh, someone is asking, do founders of the organization necessarily have to be on a board, on the board for the same? So possibly let the two panelists take that and then I'll come back with more questions. Thank you, Winnie, over to you. Kajati, will you be adding to that question? Uh, okay, um, thank you so much. This has already been uh, ably answered by one of us. However, what I would like to say very briefly that uh, um, as you sit on the board, experience shows you where to stop and where to where to, where the other one stops and there the, this one starts. However, management is in the day to day, and the board is oversight. So if you can know where each line, as I told you, the line is very thin, but through experience you get to know what is now government what is of oversight and what is day to day. So basically, I don't think I should dilute the answer that my panel, my other panelist gave it was a very elaborate answer. She even gave examples. When you see yourselves uh, recruiting, for instance, uh, these uh, lower, lower cadre, like uh, drivers, like uh, tea girls, then you know that you are now entering space that is not your, uh, your yours. So basically, that's all I can say, but there is a lot that you can explain. Thank you. Thank you, Hajati. Uh, Professor Monica, Winnie, you have a question? Winnie, if I can just add to what Hajat has said, one of the differentiating lines is the information that comes to the board. The fact that you're supposed to be handling policy and strategy so it means that you must um, challenge your management team to give you information where they are reporting about the extent to which their strategy or the agreed strategy has been um, implemented. If you now come out of that circle, then chances are you're going to cross the line and it's going to become very operational. So as much as possible, the conversation should be uh, kept at the policy level. Whenever anything happens, you have to ask the question, do we have the policy that governs this? If it is not in place, then management has to work on it so that they bring it to you for approval. Then when it comes to anything else, you, you have to learn to ask the question, what was our strategy? 
whatever we are doing, are we still aligned with the strategy? And that those kinds of questions enable you to ensure that the conversation is kept at the oversight level rather than the operational level. I, I just wanted to compliment both Stella and Hajati's um, uh, response to that question. I hope that helps. Thank you, Susan. I think it's a very important clarification, especially for many of us on the management side and yet we are aspiring to get on the other side. Um, yes, Professor Monica, kindly come in. Yes, so the question was, uh, do, do the owners necessarily have to be on the board? The quick answer to that is no, they do not necessarily have to be on the board. But the question has several layers. It depends where the company is at or where the organization is at. Usually, if it's a private company and it is starting, sometimes to safeguard the interests of the company, the owners feel like they should have some direct representation on the board. Um, also, it is more common generally in the private sector than in the public sector. If it's a listed company, generally speaking, no, they should not be. Uh, if, if by owners you talk, you are talking about owners, who stake, people who own a stake in the company must be represented on the board, need to be like shareholders. But if you are talking about you own a small, maybe you are selling, let's say produce or something, and you started a little company and all. There are benefits of having you also being in the oversight role and there are disadvantages. The obvious disadvantages are that you will not have the benefit of an independent eye looking at your affairs. So it's best to gradually remove yourself from it until completely independent people are overseeing it. There is a practice, especially in the United States, where the CEO of a company is also a member of the board. And we have examples of that here, like the New Vision and a few other organizations in Uganda. But once it, and NSSF, the prob, again, there's a problem there. If it were possible for the CEO not to be on the board, there would be some benefits. But some practicalities dictate that you have at least one person represented there. But I suppose the CEO is not necessarily always an owner. But if it is shareholders you're talking about, then they, they, they need to be on the board to safeguard the interest of the organization. And other panel members are free to contribute to this. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to direct this particular question to, to Stella. There was a question about values. And what happens if you end up on a board where you, the, the values of the entity clash with your own personal values? And if you could also match that with the do's and don'ts for management that has been invited to a board meeting, since you talked to us about that transition and the differences. Okay, thank you very much for that meeting, uh, for that question, apologies. Uh, the question of values always comes up. And uh, it's a very important uh, question. Uh, in G4G, we learn about ethics and values because if you do not have values that you aspire to or that you live your life by, it will be very difficult for you uh, to make certain decisions. Obviously, when uh, Hajat talked about cliques and uh, kitchen cabinets and the uh, meetings uh, that are done outside of the boardroom, Many of these happen because values are being compromised. Hajat, you can nod your head if you agree with me. Because <laughs> if it is not an issue of values, then the, those subjects should be discussed openly uh, where every board member is. Indeed, you have to be ready to let go of this board membership if you find that this organization or the board does not meet uh, your standards. The reason I say so is because if this organization goes down, your reputation goes down with it. I think we've had instances in the news where they arrest the CEO and then they also maybe indict the, the, the chairperson. In cases where they don't indict the chairperson or the board members, your names are still dragged in the mud. 
So if you know there is something going wrong, it's better that you move on. Uh, in my case, I've had instances where I've thought through the matter and I've had to resign from a board. And sometimes it's not even values. It could be that you do not align with the strategy of this organization or that you don't agree with uh, some of the activities that they are going to do. So we have to be ready uh, to leave because once you, you, your reputation is affected, building it up will take you a longer time. So we need to be ready for that. Uh, in terms of uh, what management is supposed to do in the boardroom, first of all, it is incumbent upon management to present clear and well thought out reports. There are times when you, you're on a board, sometimes you look at the minutes and you really wonder. <laughs> what I've done is that I, I'll, of course I'll, I'll indicate in the, in the boardroom that you know, let's amend this, let's improve this, let's do this. But most likely I'll talk to the, to the um, to the company secretary, because part of my role has been a company secretary for so many years. So I'll give them templates, I'll guide them, I'll probably even tell them, send me the minutes to look at before you share. Because having been a company secretary, even when I'm in a board meeting, by the way, I still take notes of the key decisions so that I can do a comparison. Because for some boards, the minutes come three months later, and you may have, uh, forgotten. So preparedness, uh, preparing uh, uh, correct information and truthful information. I think one of the biggest pitfalls that boards have is that sometimes management does not really tell the truth, or in some cases, uh, in law, what we call lying by omission. They have not lied, but they've also not given you the relevant information. So as a board member, it's very important for you to analyze. And that is where preparedness comes in. Because if you've read the documents, if you understand the business of the organization, you should be able to query management on certain inconsistencies that you see. And once those inconsistencies are there, you can still track and, and, and analyze how many reports are submitted to us that have errors. If you find that there are very many, then it means either management is not competent or they are deliberately you know, uh, lying to the board because that uh, can happen. So in, uh, if you're a management uh, team and you've been invited to the board, obviously you'll speak when you're uh, invited to speak because this is a board meeting. Uh, I would expect that as management, the chair will invite you to make your presentation. Once you've made your presentation, please keep quiet and allow the board members to discuss. And then just respond to the questions that they give you. If you find yourself having shouting matches and back and forth with the board members, then it means two things. Either the board has not understood their role or you've not given them enough information that enables them uh, to understand what you're communicating. Thank you. So maybe in a nutshell, what I can say, be truthful, uh, quality documentation, be present. You'll be very surprised how many people attend board meetings and they are on their phones, uh, on their computers. By the time they ask the person a question, they're actually not able to uh, to respond, so be present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stella. I would like to invite uh, Francesca. She wanted to respond to a particular question. Francesca, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Winnie. I saw an interesting question in the chat that uh, I wanted to respond to, and the other panelists can add because this is a, a, a critical one, especially for in, uh, entrepreneurs. Someone is asking, as a business owner, at what point should I introduce a board? What are the markers that an organization is board ready? Now, uh, my, my response to this uh, question is number one, if your company is registered under the Companies Act, it's a given 
that your company should have a board. Because when you go there, you submit Form 7 that has a list of your directors and a list of your company secretaries. So the question here probably should be, at what point should I start using that board? <laughs> and not, uh, at what point should I get a board? Because that board should be there if you are a registered company. I'll give you um, my experience. Uh, at Leading Boards Africa, we do have a board. And uh, coming from a, man a management, I've, I've been on the side of management as a company secretary and head of legal as well. And then on this other side, I sit on a board. So I've seen such um, immense value for having a board, uh, a board actually in place. Because the kinds of insights you get from board members are out of this world. They give you perspectives as a CEO. They give you another perspective, complete perspective of what you should expect, what you should be looking out, out for in terms of strategic direction. For example, you might be thinking that uh, this client segment is the best that I should go into, but a board member will come and give you dynamics in that client segment that you shouldn't even touch with a long stick. So they tell you, no, I think let's consider this, uh, this other client segment because it appeals to our business, it is where our business is uh, uh, best served and that kind of thing. So the value that board members bring on board cannot be um, uh, overstressed. The other thing, uh, even just away from uh, just giving you those insights, there is this um, ego eye view that board members have over the organization that you may not have as a business owner. And this is because you're, let, let me just give an analogy that's given usually of the value of a board. It is said that uh, uh, the board is like an ego over a forest. You see, it's like an ego of the, over a forest where management is working within the forest and the ego is above. So you within the forest, you'll be seeing things daily, operation, what's happening here, what's happening there, what's happening there. So you might actually not see what is above the forest. So a board member who's not involved in your business daily and has expertise they are bringing to on board will be able to see, again, on the analogy of a forest, will be able to see a fire in the eastern corner that you might not see or might be able to see something in the market that's coming that you might not be able to see as a CEO or as management that are working daily in this business. So that independent, that independent eye is very critical. And then the other thing that I've seen with boards, uh, again, both on both divides, management and at board level, is that boards will be able to make you stick to your strategic direction because you created an institution for a given purpose or to deliver a given product or to deliver a given impact in the industry. So what boards will then do is ensure that you stick to that strategy. They will be on your case every quarter, whichever amount of time you report to say, this is what we said in our strategic plan we are going to achieve. You know, We have a five-year strategic plan, we've done our annual plan. You said by, that by this quarter, we would have uh, maybe increased our market share by this amount. So the board will be able to actually put you on task to perform. And for me, that is a very critical one because it keeps you on your toes as CEO to then find out what's happening, what should I be doing, or the board is coming. I need to make sure that I deliver on the actions that were given to us at the last quarter. So the board is very valuable. Now, what are the markers that an organization is board ready? Frankly, uh, for me, uh, personally, this is my view. When is your organization ready to perform? So if you're ready for your organization to perform, then you need a board. And you don't have to start, you don't have to start extravagant. You don't have to have nine board members. Actually, for a small organization, a smaller board is more appropriate and easier to manage. So you can start with just three board members. And they have to be people that have the skills that are aligned to your strategy. Where do you want to go as an organization? So you choose the people whose skills will be able to get you there. So for example, if you're in the tech industry, you're a tech startup or a tech uh, organization, you're going to look for a board member who has ICT governance and ICT strategy skills. So that person is able to now complement where your strategy is going. So for me, um, uh, in terms of markers, you can start small and also, by the way, there are many people that are willing to give of themselves to sit on boards. You don't even have to 
you don't have to start out that you want to pay them if you cannot afford them. It is just a matter of uh, approaching someone and uh, uh, telling them that you have skills that I need on my board. Would you be willing to sit on this board? It's a voluntary position, but the value that you're getting, going to get out of this organization is good and we are growing. We will be able to pay you as and when the finances come in. So there are many people that are willing to actually come in and uh, give those services free of charge in the beginning. Of course, I mean, as a, a, a CEO or as a member of management, uh, you must be able to make sure that there's value that they are getting from your board. Um, Winnie, thank you so much. I hope I've handled this question and the other panelists can also come in. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francesca. Uh, what I love is when are you ready to perform as an entity? For me, that has been a very, it's like you hit me on the head with a hammer. You know, those names should not just be on Form 20 or Form 7, they should be working. So when are you ready to perform as an entity? That's when your board should start working. Ladies, I would like us to wrap this up. I know it is exciting. I feel like we're just actually getting into the session now. Uh, but we need to be able to wrap this up and allow people to think about what we've told them and how can they implement this starting Monday. So I would like to go around the table and just get your parting shots. I would like to start with Hajat, and then we shall go to Professor, then to Susan and to Stella, and then Francesca will come back and wrap up for us. Hajat, as you give us your last word, there's a question that I saw that really, really touched me. The lady was asking, how have you managed to be in the boardroom and, and maintain your veil? She feels that most, most times for going to the boardroom and they've had to compromise on wearing their veil, they've had to either put it off or change their dress code to be accepted. I wanted you to just please, please speak to Shamira. I think her name was Shamira. Please speak to her question and then you close and we shall go around the table and just give our closing remarks as well. Um, thank you very much, Shamila. What I'll tell Shamila is that be yourself all the time. Don't pretend to be somebody else. If you are Hajat Steviala, it means you profess to a certain religion. So please be yourself and don't pretend to be somebody else. Make sure that you deliver between when you are yourself. The minute you try to be someone else, then you are going to fail. So that's what I do. I present myself as Hajat Seviala. You take me or you leave me. You either take me or you leave me. But I am Hajat Seviala and I present myself as such. And I see many, many more people are ready to take me than to leave me, which means that you don't need to pretend to be somebody else. You, you be yourself. They know that you are Hajat. And then you keep your veil on from day one, there should be no problem. That is the answer I have to give you. How my parting note is that for those aspiring ladies, please be intentional, as I told you in my presentation. Be visible, try to be visible, try to acquire as much knowledge as possible. Attend these webinars, read the internet stuff that I have given you, go to the networks. Before you know, uh, people will be calling on you. For instance, here, people would have asked questions and we know who they are. And when you know them, if there is a reference, then you know so and so as active at this webinar, and then you can give a reference. But if you keep quiet, if you are not intentional, if you think they're going to look for you from uh, under the table, nobody's going to be to do that. You've got to stand up on the table. You've got to occupy space. Now, ladies, ladies in the boardroom, ladies on this call, and gentlemen, make sure that you occupy the space, the right space. Uh, and the, your capacity will make you occupy that space. I thank you. Thank you very much. And may we implement what we have learned today for the whole of our nation, for the good of our nation, and for the good of our soul.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank that. you, Ajax. Uh, Professor Monica. will not be very different from Hajats. I just want to say that, especially if you are a new board member, a starting board member, to remember that there is a place to start and there's no reason to feel despondent because things are looking overwhelming. And then to just be intentional about improving yourself. All of us learn. When I first joined the board, I had no idea what a financial statement looked like at all. And now I can understand the financial statement. It's taken me many years, but now I can. So take some time and learn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, Susan? Susan, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Winnie, and a big thank you to all the panelists for the information that has been shared and for the insights given by our keynote speaker. My parting words to the ladies would be as follows. Attending this webinar, demonstrates without a doubt that you have interest in governance. So it is more important for you to move forward by getting more information about the subject. For those who are already on boards, maybe you are on a small board, remember that what you do on that board is what is going to make you a good candidate for the next board. So please make sure that you add value, that your fellow board members are also seated in different committees. Once they see that you are somebody who is adding value, then they will more or less recommend you to other boards. And personally, that was my journey because I was recommended by Professor Monica here to another board. So, but uh, she, she's never shared with me the insights of why she thought I would do a good job. But the starting point is to know that where you are is where you need to shine in order for you to move to the next level. For those who are already on the big boards, don't think you have arrived. There's always more to learn. And I would like to push you to challenge yourselves, challenge yourselves to do more, volunteer, sit on different committees because it presents you with more opportunities to be exposed to different subject matters, to be able to network with different people. And that in itself will make you visible to the next board. And before you know it, you'll be introducing yourself as a career board member, the way Hajat Seviala introduced herself. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you, Susan. Stella, your parting shot. I want to thank you for this uh, opportunity. I think everything has been said, uh, visibility, doing a good job, living by certain values, um, if someone comes to me and they do asking um, for board member nominations, there's no way I can nominate you if I don't trust that you do a good job. If I don't trust that you leave the values of that organization where I'm uh, recommending you. Uh, lastly, let's prepare ourselves. We've started this journey for those who have just started by joining this call. Do the work that you need to do. Uh, go through those gathering years, as G4G says, and uh, let's remember that success occurs when opportunity meets preparation. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Stella. You've been a wonderful advocate for the Girls for Girls program. I wanted to just put that in before we go off. I would like to invite Francesca, who is the CEO for Leading Boards Africa, to close the session for us and also tell us what can we do after this? Now we, we're excited, we are learning, but what happens after now? 
<clears throat> hey, wow, thank you so much, uh, Winnie. That was a very wonderful discussion and discourse. I'm sure the ladies have picked up so many uh, nuggets and insights into getting board ready for the aspiring directors, how can, you can sit on boards for the new directors, how you can actually um, increase your influence on that board and actually bring yourself to that board and give to the company. And for the uh, board members who, are, who have been board members for such a long time, how you can also aspire for more. Thank you so much, Professor Monica. Thank you, Hajati, for the keynote speech. That was wonderful. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much, Stella. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. It has been a very wonderful discussion. Um, ladies and uh, gentlemen, allow me to speak to you about the board readiness program. You've uh, heard a lot about getting board ready. How do I get board ready? How do I get myself ready to sit on a board? Now, ICGU, which is the Institute of Corporate Governance, Uganda, and Leading Boards Africa are bringing to you a board readiness program that is going to answer all the questions that you've heard today. This is a flagship product for Leading Boards Africa and uh, ICGU. And uh, the background to all this is that at LBA and ICGU as well, we believe that everything rises and falls with governance and leadership. So the BRP is part of our vision to see transformed and sustainable client organization. We know that transformation does not happen overnight. It has to begin at the top. The board has to set the tone at the top, and then that tone will flow down to the rest of management. We conducted an informal survey that showed us that there was actually a lot of appetite for trainings and uh, skills development in the area of getting board ready and for existing directors in the area of how they can actually bring value to the boards, how they can understand what's expected of them. So this is a program whose time has come. Um, this is a new and exciting director training program, which we developed at Leading Boards Africa and have now partnered with uh, the Institute of Corporate Governance, the Pioneer Institute here in Uganda to bring you uh, a program that's going to address the four fundamental precepts of being a successful director. Number one is your knowledge set, what you know. Secondly is your skill set. What kinds of skills do you have that you're bringing on board? Your mindset, do you have the mindset? And I think Stella touched on that. Do you have the mindset of a board member for you to be able to actually provide that strategic direction? The behavior set, and uh, Haja talked about kitchen cabinets and all the behaviors that make some boards um, uh, that makes some boards dysfunctional. So we have also put together a curriculum that addresses the behavior set and the right behaviors that are expected in the boardroom. Now the knowledge set, as you may have already uh, discovered, is the director's understanding and appropriate application of essential practical and theoretical information. It is the skill set, is the expertise that you bring on board. The mindset is your attitude and disposition that shapes your responses and behavior. And lastly, the behavior set, which is also something we are going to touch. Now, this framework is not, uh, this framework is uh, benchmarked against the director competence framework developed by the Institute of Directors UK. So what Leading Board did with our experts, we got that competence framework and customized it and uh, adjusted it to fit within our setting, to fit within what we think is uh, what directors need, what someone needs to be able to be effective. Now, the, the, the details of the knowledge set and skill set and the things we are going to handle in this program are right there. Knowledge set, we look at strategy, of course, at oversight level, strategy, finance, we will not go into management training, uh, of giving you a yearly training in strategy, no, but we will be giving you key strategic tools that you can use actually to provide strategic um, oversight. We'll look at finance. How does a lawyer like me understand a balance sheet, understand uh, the other financial statements for me to be able to provide value at board level? We'll look at governance. What do you, what, what is the role of a director? What key insights should you have as a director to be able to actually be governance mature to provide uh, effective oversight? We look at issues of legal and risk, 
stakeholder management, which is very critical as a board member, your networks are critical and they become the net worth of the company as well. So we look at ICT awareness, which is a new one in this digital era that we are working on, working in. So that will be a critical one under knowledge set. We have skill set, which will look at strategic thinking. It will look at analysis and use of information. As board members, you have a lot of information. We have a lot of information coming to us from management. Sometimes the board pack total um, page numbers can be around 100 or even more in some institutions. And you're expected to read that information ahead of the meeting, like Hajat has told us, and be able to deliver value. So how do you analyze and use information? Analyze a lot of information, but pick out the key insights for you to be able to be effective. We'll look at decision making. How do you make decisions at board level? And then we'll look at leadership, because your call as a board member is to provide leadership. We don't want boardrooms where management and the board are really at loggerheads. You're quarreling. In most of the boards that have, uh, we are working with as leading boards, one of the key questions is board management relationships. How do we handle? So it looks like as board members, we are stressing um, the management teams wherever we are. And so that is something that we'll look at under skill set. And then we'll also look at performance management. Now, in terms of mindset, we'll look at self-leadership because there's no way you can lead as a board member without leading yourself. We'll look at EQ and SQ in the boardroom, people building, how do you build the management teams? How do you make sure that as a board and as management, you're working on the same team? Because actually that should be the ideal, that should be what it is. You're working on the same team. So how do we make sure that you're all on the same team? People building is critical to that. Stella has emphasized ethical behavior as a board member. Remember you're setting the tone at the top. Um, we have to, to ensure that the behavior we are modeling is ethical. Ethical leadership is actually one of the key uh, kings of King Four. So that's something we'll be going on, going to, and then good judgment. How do you exercise good judgment amidst so many options? We we'll look at the behavior set, and this will look particularly at trust building, the art of persuasion, and influencing, persuading and influencing, conflict resolution, boardroom decorum, and then boardroom politics, aka uh, kitchen cabinets, uh, decisions made outside the boardroom, uh, group think, and many others. So this is what the program is going to focus on. And I would like to invite every lady on this particular webinar to actually sign in to this program as and when it's launched. It's going to be launched in November, uh, November 18th. But then it will start, we will start in February 2022 with the cohort that we are going to start with. It will be limited space, but it's open to the public. So it's up to you to actually grab the space and come. Um, 15 modules, uh, your cost is 1,000, might go up. Uh, our, our champions at both institutions are still discussing that. And then, of course, these are going to be the ways that uh, that program is going to be delivered. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to invite you to the board readiness program that's going to be run by Leading Boards Africa and uh, ICGU. It's, uh, it's a program that has, has been benchmarked to international best practice. As you have seen, we borrowed the competence framework of the Institute of Directors UK, and we've customized it and added in more that we think would be great for you. So when that program launches, please be sure to sign on. Okay, I think that concludes uh, everything about board readiness. I just want to say thank you so much to all the participants that have signed in. At one point we had almost, uh, I think we're going to 87 and above of the participants. Thank you so much for giving us your evenings. I hope that you've taken away a lot from this particular webinar. There'll be more webinars like this uh, from Leading Boards Africa and ICGU, and uh, please be sure to sign in. Thank you so much, Winnie, for facilitating that session very well. We appreciate you. Thank you, Primera. You have been an amazing host. Thank you so much. And please send our thank yous to Girls for Girls for hosting this session. We appreciate you a lot. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you very much. And good evening, everyone. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.